we were actually uh, in my we were actually in the midst of the lockdowns uh, during the audition process. Um, it was actually on the tail end of it, and um, so everything was uh, done via self tape. Uh, I just received an email from my agent, as I would with any other job, um, just with a, a little brief breakdown. I wasn't given the full script; it was just the the couple of scenes that I was requested to tape for, and. Um, they, they'd asked that I submit a three, four minute clip just telling them a, a little story about something that something interesting that had happened uh, in my life. I, I, I took it as they um, just wanted to get to get a sense of my own personality. And um, so I, I had to kind of fill in the blanks a little bit because I didn't have a, a whole lot of backstory on, on the character and, um, and, and the entire script. But uh, that was later given to me when I received the callback and I met Tom and we started doing chemistry reads and I really can connected with the script. Yeah, very, very similar as well. Like I just received the, like a regular, any other audition sort of process, you get the breakdown and maybe you get the script. Um, with Goran, they also sent a director's uh, statement as well. Just sort of, you know, really it was just like his thoughts on what he was there to create. And um, that's always, uh, you know, um, a privilege getting that because you don't always get that. Um, but he really was trying, to convey sort of what he was here to do. And uh, he also attached some links to his previous work and some references and some mood reels. And so all of that, you know, that really, I mean, that's, that's when I really decided that I really loved it and I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to work with him. But yeah, as Elias said, it was like an audition process. It was quite lengthy, chemistry reads. Um, I read with Elias a couple of times and then they dropped Hattie in the mix and we got to read with her and we got to do like the car scene via Skype um and then next minute we're on set well for me um I, I, for me it's all about the feeling so when i was reading it um there i could see certain aspects of myself in particular the vulnerability and um just kind of growing up and trying to trying to uh, like despite your identity it's more just like trying to discover yourself and um i saw a lot of that in cole um and i was really able to relate to that so that's that's what i brought to it yeah, I think that the what you said, the slice of life um, aspect of it was a huge draw card for me um, because that's the type of film that I'm that I that I'm very very interested in. You know, I love love films like that, um, especially when the dialogue feels like supernatural um, to the point where it almost feels unscripted. Like that is my favorite kind of movie. So when I read it and then I got to meet Goran and he's a genius and then I got to meet Elias and he's a genius, yeah. you know, you just want to, you have to be a part of it, right? You'd be an idiot to say no. Um, I was given a list of films to watch by Goran. Um, you know, a Moldova films, um, uh, Kislowski films as well. Like the, you know, the three colors trilogies. I watched a lot of different films to sort of, um, I guess know where Adam was when he, when the film starts and what his, his interests were. And, uh, I also made a, a playlist that I had playing most of the, uh, most of the shoot. Um, you know, it was Billy Holiday and Tori Amos and Elliot Smith. It was a lot of that. And a lot of ro learning how to roll cigarettes as well. <laughs> uh, in my case, yeah, I mean, music certainly helped, but, um, for me, it was more, um, Goran and I spent quite a bit of time uh, before the shoot going through the script in its entirety um, and not, not necessarily rehearsing. It was more just um, understanding the subtext and uh, what was not being said and like, like the internal, all the internal aspects of, uh, of what's going on in Cole's head. So that made it, um, that certainly made it helpful on set and um, the cast and the crew in particular were very respectful and everyone was on the same page. So, um, like in a certain scene where mm. like there's a bit of vulnerability and emotion, um, they, they certainly gave us our space when we needed it and everyone was very respectful. So we all worked together. Um, I was reading a story by the writer Lauren Groff, who I love, uh, and it was a story about an Irish schoolboy that falls in love with a cadaver in a small town, like, anyway. That's just the context. And then halfway through the story, he goes to his first ever party. 
and we got to this paragraph, like, and I was loving the story. I finished it eventually, but when I got to this paragraph, I could not get to the next one because anytime I tried, I had to keep rereading the same sentence over and over again. If it steps into this room where the party is, and it's got like, you know, transported into the one party in high school that I have gone okay. to. And it was just so vivid, like this memory. And it's not a time of my life I think back to almost ever. Um, because um, it wasn't a time I even, like, even when I was living in, it wasn't very present day to day in my circumstances. Like, it was just like, high school was just the waiting room before you finally go to university and life could actually begin, you know? And yeah, but like, you know, I was reading this now, uh, thinking back to this moment now in my, you know, well into my 30s. Uh, as a very different personality, but like suddenly this very vivid feeling of what who I was, this kid, you know, what my mindset was, what I thought life would be, what I thought life was, was really vivid to me. And then thinking about that in the context of who I became a few years later and later again now, um, I was just wanted to live in that feeling a little bit longer and see if some, if a story could come out of it that you know wasn't really about me, it was about something that you know. I could preserve those feelings and connect other people with them, uh, other viewers. And in, in you know, in, in that in that moment, I started you know these two energies of these two characters started kind of emerging. And it was like two men. I had this intense vision of two men stuck in a car across Melbourne back in the day, um, who were stuck together, having to talk and keep talking, and just like the dynamic that emerges and a flood of dialogue came at me and. Uh, it was like 2 a.m. on like a, you know Monday night, and I just kind of rushed out of bed and like started typing frantically to just keep up with the words you know, of, of, of this dialogue that was coming to me. And a week later, I actually finished writing it. It was almost like a week long manic episode where I just couldn't do anything else. And then I went back to read the rest of the story, which was excellent. <laughs> My favorite, completely. I really it. So, yeah. <laughs> Again, living in those fields, it was just sort of like. Um, like having not really been present in that time of my life, um, I was kind of reliving it. Like I was li living it in the past tense, in, a, in the way I never did in the present tense, um, and processing these feelings. And also, like I was, I was very. Um, in 1999, I had just migrated uh, to Australia. I wasn't yet 17; I was 14 at the time. Um, and I was really like emotionally dislocated. I, I did not want to be there, and it wasn't Australia's fault. It was kind of like my psychology that was preventing me. From connecting with the place and still does significantly actually. But um there was this sense that like, you know, real life was happening elsewhere, where Wonka Y was, where Isabella Care was, you know, not where I was. <laughs> and sort of like it felt for you know feelings to have any value or importance, they had to be like cinematic, really, they had to be somewhere else. I didn't think feelings happened in my day-to-day -day life or that they mattered. Um, so this was like almost an exercise to try and make those feelings matter and start to feel like they did have value, you know, to, to make them cinematic, but not by twisting them or shaping them into, you know, or romanticizing Melbourne in any way. I just wanted to kind of capture it exactly as it was in the worst possible sense, be very honest, um, you know, this least romantic place in the world, but to kind of build something that did feel romantic and transporting and sort of like powerful, you know, I, I, I really, like, I wanted a strong feeling in, in, in the viewer's chest, really, that, that came away um, so that it, it could live in the same medium as, you know, Isabel Perrin, <laughs> and a lot of her, and all the other people I grew up with and worshipping. I, I'm very lucky that, you know, I was able to make part of that, you know, because I think usually there's an attempt to make you just, you know, keep making the same movie over and over again. Although my agent is very good at not sending me horror scripts. I love her for it, but um, look, I, I, I'm sort of like to me, you won't be only is my brain split between two those two women essentially, and this movie is my brain split between these two men. Clearly, really, I'm, I'm a little bit of evidence as well. Um, so the process was kind of quite similar in the sense that I'm always like in this moment, what is she feeling or what is he feeling? How do I make the viewer? Feel this, feel this. So I shape, you know, the framing and the cutting in the rhythm of that to, to make someone feel like they're under their skin, you know, in, in, in kind of a similar way. Um, and like, I know obviously they're very different in terms of genre and so on and so forth, but you could easily call this film You Won't Be Alone. And the title would be just specifically <laughs> right, you know. Um, and I think like both of them kind of are 
uh, about people who are like really yearning for a connection while being lonely in a very specific way because of circumstances. So you know, to me, I see like quite a lot of parallels, and I don't really think of you know in terms of my career in a strategic sense. I'm always like like everything I write that I think is worth filming, I'm just so obsessively emotionally attached to. Those things, I have the permission to do that one. Like I'm not like I, this one has to be next. This one has to be next. When uh, before I finished your work, BL1, we already had um, my third, what's now my third film, Finance, and I've just finished editing that one now. Um, so I knew I was going on to that, but I had this gap in the middle, and I was like, maybe I can't do other names because I just written it because it was like super raw. And also, it's usually between writing a film and directing it, like, you know, years pass, and you do like a hell of a time lives. And I feel like sometimes it was a danger of becoming disconnected from the core of the story, whereas other names were still so fresh with me. You know, in my blood, I could, feel, I could feel it in a physical way. And I was like, ah, I think it's now because I think the way it will come out now will be so much more, you know, emotionally intense than it would if I did it like, you know, years from now. And I don't know if I'll ever be able to make a movie. Let's see how anyone be able to come out anyway. Um, but yeah, I was very lucky that we got to finance quite quickly. And I went from like the final day of, like the final day of Stan Mix when you were be alone was like July 26th, 2021. And July 27th was my first casting meeting for Urban Age. So I went back to back to back. And then I finished like Urban Age on May the 18th. On May the 19th in the morning, I was coming to Macedonia to start shooting the third one. So it's been fucking insane. I don't think it's sustainable, but I feel, it to be, I feel very lucky. Because all three of them are films that, like, you know, they were kind of logistically right in some ways, but you're never doubting, like, why am I doing this? Like, I'm so emotionally involved in them, but, like, there's a kind of bar to clear with anything I ever want to do again. <laughs>